Session. Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon session of the Brisbane Ideas Festival, where we are going to be looking at the idea of sustainable growth, an oxymoron. I'm Marius Benson. I'm with ABC News Radio, and it's my pleasure to introduce Carmen Lawrence. Just before I do that, I might uh, mention to establish in our, our minds what we're talking about today. I was born in 1953, so I am from the epicentre of the baby boom, and growth has been the holy grail of all governments in my lifetime. And if I look to my parents' generation, they were depression people, the amount of stuff they acquired in their life was, was small compared to the amount of stuff I've acquired in my life, and I suspect my 12-year-old son has acquired more in his short life than they did in their entire lives. And the world is paying a price for that. There has been a transformation of our view of the world, I think, uh, from my parents' generation to the current time. My parents saw the world physically as a large and threatening place, and now we see it as a small, limited, fragile resource. So it has changed a lot. In the year of my birth, there were two and a half billion people in the world. There are now seven billion people in the world. We're heading for maybe nine or 10 billion people in the world. There are some hundreds of millions enjoying our standard of living, and there are billions watching our standard of living and intending to emulate it. So growth will happen, that's a certainty, but uh, what impact it will have on the planet is the thing that we have to some extent within our control as the dominant species. Carmen Lawrence is going to be addressing the issue today. She is a trailblazer in Australian public life. She has been for three decades. She was a state minister in WA, the first woman to lead a state in Australia, the first premier when she was premier of Western Australia, a federal minister. She left politics four years ago and is now the director of the Centre for the Study of Social Change in the School of Psychology at the University of Western Australia. And the idea she is addressing today, as I said, is sustainable growth, an oxymoron. So I'll now invite Dr Lawrence to see if she can square that circle by matching sustainability with growth. Thank you very much indeed, Marius. It's a pleasure to be here in Brisbane again. Um, I was just saying I had an opportunity a couple of years ago to speak uh, to an Ideas Festival, and it's great to be back. I want to address this question, I suppose, from the point of view of the environment, but ultimately human beings on the planet. We sometimes talk about the planet as if it were at risk, and certainly there are risks to biodiversity and consequences of pollution and the pollution of resources that are part of what I want to talk about. But ultimately, the planet can survive without us. And that's, I suppose, a thought that I want to put into your heads. What is the effect that we have on the planet? And how can we ameliorate some of the adverse effects? I don't know if you're familiar with the work of an economist called Kenneth Boulding, but fairly mainstream, a little perhaps to the left of centre in his views. But in his mid-career, he said this, and this is well before the problems we confront today. Anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> and there are a lot of them around. I want to start by looking at how we live today. And to repeat Tony Judd's question in an ABC Radio National program of uh, earlier this year. Sadly, he is now deceased. But in this, he asked, how did we come to think in exclusively economic terms about policy? And there are a lot of people, myself included, who agree with Tony Judd that something is profoundly wrong with the way we live today. In his last book, Ill Fares the Land, Judd argued that for the last three decades, we've made a virtue out of the pursuit of material goals to such an extent, he says, that this very pursuit now constitute what remains of our sense of collective purpose. It's a pretty horrible thought, really. He suggested that this pursuit is now firmly entrenched in an orthodoxy which judges achievement and public good in just about exclusively economic rather than moral terms. The result is that when we consider whether to support a particular proposal or initiative, we often don't ask whether it's good or bad, whether it will help bring about a better society or a better world, but rather, how will it affect the economy? Whether it is efficient, whether it will lead to increases in the GDP, and if so, how much it will contribute to growth. 
Most people, of course, don't appear to regard this as a problem. The equation of well-being with economic growth is actually taken as a given by most people. And the identity of society with economy, which is embedded in that idea, is seen by many as uncontentious. Indeed, they don't see any alternative to this construction, even if they're a bit worried about it. It's simply the way the world works. There is no alternative. Almost without exception, politicians, business people, journalists and financial commentators regard the need for economic growth as unarguable. Indeed, they won't argue it with you. In fact, to raise questions about economic growth is often to risk banishment from contemporary political discussion, regarded as flaky, slightly off the planet. But as Judd has pointed out, this avoidance of moral considerations in assessing public policy and the restriction of policy discussions to the narrow economic questions of profit and loss is not, as he sees it, an inevitable human tendency, as Marius indeed pointed out with his parents. But as he put it, an acquired taste, and a fairly recent one at that. Much of what we judge to be natural today would probably surprise our grandparents, actually. The focus on growth, for example, rather than prosperity or the standard of living or well-being accelerated during the neoliberal dominance in the 80s when we saw the emergence, I think, of an obsession with wealth creation, as it's called, an increasing push to privatise public assets and, as a result, growing disparities between rich and poor, both within and between nations. And I'll revisit that question in a little while. At the core of this is an uncritical admiration of the free market, a naive belief, as I see it, in endless growth, and particularly in the United States, but increasingly in the Anglophone countries, hostility toward government action to modify any of these results. Taxation, for instance, has become a dirty word, apparently. As a consequence, a nation's progress is now almost invariably judged by how it implements policies which lead to growth in the scale and the scope of market activity. Growth is the answer to every problem. More economic growth is invariably seen as beneficial. Other national attributes, such as the level of equality, the incidence of social problems, the respect for human rights, the health and well-being of citizens, the state of the environment, and the contribution to global citizenship, to name a few, and I'm sure you could think of many more, are not given very much weight or much publicity. However, this near-exclusive focus on growth appears to make people uneasy. At the same time as they're experiencing higher and higher levels of material comfort, one survey showed that 83% of Australians endorsed the view that Australian society today is too materialistic, with too much emphasis on money and not enough on the things that really matter. Although if you listen to the conversations after the recent budget, you'd wonder whether that is actually what they believe. However, it remains the case that for many, especially those in a position to influence public policy, the economy and society are identical. If one grows, the other must be improving, along with the quality of people's lives. The market is seen as immutable and inevitable. Indeed, a mechanical process, optimal for arbitrating decisions about what resources are available and who should share in them. We're told that left alone, markets will produce the most efficient, God, I've come to hate that word, and just outcomes. While this confidence may have been shaken a little, and only a little, in the recent financial meltdown, it re rebounded remarkably quickly on the foundation of taxpayer-funded bailouts of the corporate victims of market failure. I, of course, put that in inverted commas. There are, of course, people who dissent from this orthodoxy, people who recognise that markets are part of a broader social fabric, that they're human creations which come in a variety of forms. Just have a look at China. Governed by rules and supported by agreed conventions and legislation often, and which don't always produce optimal outcomes for society. I commend to you a very entertaining treatise on capitalism by a fairly orthodox economist, in fact, the Cambridge economist Ha Jun Chang, uh, South Korean originally. He examines the extravagant claims of the free market fundamentalists and concludes that the fundamental theoretical and empirical assumptions behind free market economics are highly questionable. And I was reminded of the fact in reading a paper today that neoclassical economics origina originated in a bastardisation of the now discredited 19th century physics. We've forgotten that, and they haven't changed either. <laughs>
A cursory perusal of any day's media will reveal our continued collective fixation with tracking changes in economic growth, usually indicated by shifts in gross domestic product, GDP, as we come to know it. Regular bulletins on the state of the GDP are issued, indeed quarterly and sometimes more frequently, and events such as the recent floods and cyclones here in Queensland are read through the prism of their effects on growth. People don't always ask in the long term, well, what about the people? The goal of economic growth is clearly the touchstone for judging major public policy decisions and is the most familiar subject of economic commentary in the media. Economies and firms are judged not just by whether they're growing, but by how fast they grow. Some have described this as a secular religion, and the historian J.R. McNeil concluded that the overarching priority of economic growth was easily the most important idea of the 20th century. And like a great many people, I think it's an idea we should now thoroughly question. Until recently, little attention was paid to the costs of such a focus. Now the consequences of environmental degradation and rising CO2 emissions, together with challenges to economic orthodoxy from within the profession, I'm pleased to say, are forcing some reassessment. It hasn't yet trickled over to the political side of our debate, nonetheless. As Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz has argued, using the language of orthodox economics, pollution is a global externality, as they call it, of enormous proportions. This is similar to the view expressed by Ross Garno in reporting on the economic effects of climate change. That, as he puts it, polluters are not paying the costs of the damage they cause. And if you listen to their arguments, they don't intend to either. Aurel puts it more bluntly. The real credit crunch is not the one involving banks, but the one involving the environment. It's obvious when you think about it that there are two main emissions from the models and theories of growth in neoclassical economics, the economics that shapes our decisions today. These omissions are the planet and the human families and communities which live within it. It may seem strange to say, but I hope to convince you of that. These models neglect the fact that the human economy is embedded in the biosphere. It's not a closed system that exists, exists separately from it. It consists of living things, the products of living things, and the necessary resources and conditions for living things to survive and thrive. When they're considered at all, such resources tend to be viewed as infinite. Indeed, that's the nature of economic models of growth. Energy economist Adelman, writing in 1993, not so long ago, said, and I quote, minerals are inexhaustible and will never be depleted. He should have a look at some of the scarce minerals that we're coping with today. Often consideration of these limits is simply omitted altogether. So problems are effectively de uh, defined out of existence. If you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. But recently, Nobel Prize winning economist and New York Times columnist Paul Krugman reminded his readers that we're living in a finite world one in which resource constraints are becoming increasingly binding. And eminent UK economist Partha Dasgupta has acknowledged we economists see nature when we see it at all as a backdrop from which resources and services can be drawn in isolation. Macroeconomic forecasts routinely exclude natural capital. Accounting for nature, if it comes into the calculus at all, is usually an afterthought to the real business of doing economics. It is, after all, called an externality. We economists, he says, have been so successful in the enterprise that if someone exclaims economic growth, no one needs ask growth in what? We all know they mean growth in the gross domestic product. Common sense tells us that there's a difference between the mere monetary transactions captured by the GDP, it literally is just cash changing hands, and the genuine addition to a nation's well-being, although we forget to talk about the latter. It's clear indeed that increases in GDP do not necessarily indicate any improvement at all in the quality of life, because as I'm sure many of you know, it has a number of major shortcomings, including the failure to account for how increased output is distributed. It talks about averages, and it doesn't talk about inequality. It omits household and voluntary work altogether, so all the work you do rearing your children doesn't count. The inclusion of expenditures incurred because of pollution Transport, industrial accidents, war, crime, ill health, they don't count. 
the failure to account for changes in the value of stock of both built and natural capital, or to measure public services such as parks purchased, that aren't purchased in the market. None of these things matter to the GDP. Fundamentally, it says nothing about the content of the transactions which make up the GDP, in other words. More or less of something doesn't mean a thing unless we know of what. And all of this matters because adopting growth as the preeminent social and economic goal and using the GDP as its index fixes the direction and content of national policy. There isn't any really complicated debate beyond it. If we continue to ignore the shortcomings of both the goal, growth, and the measure, GDP, policies will keep heading us in the wrong direction, diminishing people's quality of life and destroying the natural environment on which it depends. I guess part of what I'm doing today is revisiting the limits to growth. It's a deeply unfashionable thing to do. Whether the focus is on pollution, biodiversity loss, resource depletion or climate change, I think we have to acknowledge that the underpinning cause is the same. The human consumption that drives economic growth, that indeed we're invited to drive economic growth. As the ecologist Jane Lubchenco said in her address as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1998, during the last few decades, humans have emerged as a new force of nature. We are modifying physical, chemical and biological systems in new ways at faster rates and over larger spatial scales than ever recorded. And it's accelerated even more since she spoke. Humans, she says, have unwittingly embarked upon a grand experiment with our planet. The outcome of this experiment is unknown, but has profound implications for all life on Earth. It's no accident that, that the current era is often this, now described as the Anthropocene. Our levels of consumption in the developed world are high and rising. And in the West, we're more affluent and wasteful than we've ever been. I don't know if any of you saw some programs this week, and I've left the piece of paper aside, unfortunately, that appeared, I think, uh, on both SBS and ABC, of young children in Ghana on a dump of electronic waste that had come from the developed world. Illegally, probably. Nonetheless, from the United States, from Europe, they were smashing this equipment, burning the plastic in order to retrieve the metals and earning maybe a dollar a day to do this. You can imagine living on a dump of a burning plastic, uh, named by the locals who live uh, in poverty, it has to be said generally, but it's so awful they call it Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the sort of waste that we're talking about on this planet, and it's growing. Add to that the rising affluence of the middle classes in India and China who are beginning to consume like we are, and it's obvious that climate change isn't the only momentous problem we're facing. There are many serious commentators who believe we're already shooting, overshooting the Earth's carrying capacity, the Earth's capacity to carry us. Visit any large city and just stand for a minute in a shopping centre or a supermarket and witness the vast activity of the modern marketplace. Think about the mobilisation of resources and energy from around the world required to, do, to present those goods to you. And two questions I think will immediately suggest themselves. How can this last? And I think more importantly perhaps, because it helps answer the other question or su suggest some solutions, do we actually benefit from all of that consumption? Does Gupta, whose name I mentioned earlier, has demonstrated that a country's wealth per capita can decline even while GDP per capita increases? And the UN Development Index might indeed be recording improvement as well. That's because, as I mentioned, GDP doesn't deduct the depreciation, particularly of natural capital, since na nature is taken to be a fixed and indestructible factor of production. How people can carry these assumptions around their heads, I don't know. Well, they must have their eyes closed simultaneously. As he points out, the problem with this assumption is that it is simply wrong. Nature consists of degradable resources, agricultural land, forest, watersheds, fisheries, freshwater sources, river estuaries and the atmosphere are capital assets that are to a degree self-regenerative but suffer from depletion and deterioration when they are overused. Consider too the world's fisheries. The global catch rose from 19 million tonnes a year in 1950 to 18 
80 million tonnes by 1990, with the result that 70%, 70% of the world's saltwater fish are judged to be overexploited or fully exploited. And I don't think fish farms are going to make up the difference, by the way. Some fisheries have collapsed altogether. Similarly, many of the planet's mineral and energy resources are being used so rapidly that we're fast approaching and may even have passed the peak of production, the case of oil being the most often debated. A decade ago, when I raised the question of peak oil in the parliament, in a very tentative way, it has to be said, because I'd launched a small program in Western Australia trying to draw attention to the possible problems we might confront as oil became more and more expensive. I was pilloried and laughed at, uh, particularly by the treasurer of the day, uh, Mr Costello. <laughs> it is now the case, of course, that the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has agreed that we've probably already passed peak oil. Modern, modern economies have evolved on the basis of the availability of cheap oil. Cheap to extract, cheap to use, it permeates uh, every corner of our daily lives, both as a source of energy and as a component of manufactured goods. We often forget the latter. Our computers, for instance, wouldn't be possible without oil. No major industrial society today can survive without oil, and we don't have substitutes in many cases. Food, transport, heating, plastics, cars, drugs, prosthetics, computers, housing. But global oil production, as you know, is forecast to peak and maybe has already then begin to decline, the so-called big rollover, the important point there being that demand will start to exceed supply and prices will rise. One of the things I think that we haven't anticipated, anticipated about this, and perhaps this is the upside, uh, has been pointed out by Jeff Rubin, who's a Canadian economist. You see, there are some good guys in here. He comes actually from a very orthodox background, but he's had a good hard look at oil. And he said uh, recently, the world is running out of oil that we can afford to burn. There's still oil around. The tar sands of Canada are being exploited at a fantastic rate, but it's very expensive oil. And he concludes after a very thorough examination of this question, that current economic models which support globalization no longer make sense. Because if you think about it, all of that transport between nations of raw materials from Australia to China and then back with the goods uh, depend on oil fundamentally. And he argues that in the foreseeable future, we cannot access cheap wages, which is what we're doing, with costly fuel. Now, the upside is that he thinks this will result in more local uh, uh, production, that people will be forced to go back to producing in their own communities. There will be an emphasis on regional economies and greater self-sufficiency, and the economic focus will return to agriculture and manufacturing jobs. But we won't be able to consume as much stuff because it will altogether be more expensive. Now, that's, that's a formulation that I think bears thinking about in closer examination. But even if we ignore the global uh, warming imperative to decrease oil use, even the most unvarnished optimists recognise that new fields in prospect won't cover the shortfall if we continue growth as usual. And despite optimistic pronouncements, which you'll hear about technology and dematerialisation, that's one of those great words, of advanced economies, we don't actually need input resources anymore. The aggregate volume of material used globally and in most regions is also rising quickly. So it's not just oil. Resources like wood, sand, minerals, biomass are being used at ever-increasing rates. And even though some of those processes are more efficient, the expansion of scale means that the per capita use continues to grow inexorably. These changes, it's important to recognise, have human impacts too. The World Bank recently highlighted the fact that a third of the world's population faces water scarcity, that 70% of the world's fisheries, as I've mentioned, are overexploited, that soil degradation affects a significant portion of both irrigated and rain-fed agricultural lands, and that every year at least a million people die prematurely from respiratory illnesses linked to air pollution. There are strong arguments now, including from within the profession of economics, that growth indicators like the GDP and the concept of growth itself fail to capture in any way these unfolding environmental and humanitarian challenges. Indeed, that they mask inequities and fail to register actual declines in well-being. There have been some attempts to develop genuine progress indicators, but they haven't been taken seriously by governments. I want to, uh, I guess, finish this uh, discussion from my point of view before we go to questions on the psychological downside of growth. 
Despite these attempts to develop somewhat more complex understandings of human progress, policymakers still use economic growth as an indication of happiness. And while it's true that increasing um, income improves health and well-being up to a point, the gains, whether measured at individual or at social levels, flatten out very quickly. Indeed, the estimate, if using Australian dollars, is somewhere around about $20,000. As many have shown, at low levels of economic development, when people live in poverty, of course, even modest economic gains produce significant effects on the quality of life. I'm not arguing that point. Better food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, all influence life expectancy and the sense of well-being and happiness. It improves uh, people's happiness when they feel better. In these circumstances, it makes sense for national policy to focus on economic growth. But beyond a certain threshold, and as I've suggested, it turns out to be quite a modest level of income, further growth results in little gain in either well-being or life expectancy. At this point, other factors are far more significant influences on the quality and length of life. And there's now a very substantial literature in my discipline and in sociology and in, to some extent in economics on subjective well-being, as it's called, which is designed to assess, to, to assess exactly what factors do affect people's perceptions of the quality of their lives. It's usually based on large surveys of national uh, differences in responses to questions about happiness and general satisfaction. It can, can sometimes look a bit naff, but they have now been doing it for about 20 years and it seems reasonably reliable. The scope of such studies is extensive now, ranging from questions about whether and to what extent increases in income result in greater happiness to the effects of marriage on happiness and the impact of crime levels on life satisfaction. So it's a broad field. But this subjective well-being, measured by self-reports, indicates what people think about the quality of their lives. And I guess it's no surprise that the two most important predictors of life satisfaction are health and family. And while studies show that there is, as I suggest, also a positive correlation with income at lower levels, it peters out very quickly when you get to higher levels of income. And some recent research suggests that at a national level, subjective well-being depends less on income and more on people's perception that they have free choice in their lives rather than being subject to external authority. One study found that people tend to be happier under social democratic welfare regimes. Another study has shown that the major cultural groups, happiness is linked, in major cultural groups, I apologise, happiness is linked with people's sense of freedom. And some of what I'm sure we're seeing in the Middle East now plays into this. In the most recent international comparisons, Inglehart and his colleagues take this a step further and they show that democratisation and growing social tolerance contribute to a rising feeling that people have free choice and control of their lives. Using an index of the extent to which a given community accepted people of other races, immigrants and homosexuals as neighbours, they showed that people living in more tolerant societies tend to be happier no matter what their own beliefs, even if they happen to be prejudiced. In their review of the literature, Diner and Seligman, who have done a lot of work in this field, concluded that people with the highest reports of well-being are not those who live in the wealthiest countries. Indeed, Costa Rica tends to come top. But those who live in nations which have effective political institutions, where human rights are protected, where corruption is low and mutual trust is high. And they're not related to economic growth although there is some overlap, obviously. A rational response to this would be to shift the policy goals toward improving the quality of life rather than to continue the inflexible pursuit of economic growth as if it were a good in itself. In fact, what this research shows is that beyond a certain point, it's relative income that matters. We're perverse human beings. And across the board rise in income will have little effect on happiness, maybe a transitory one. There's also evidence that people readily adapt to circumstances, so today's pay rise uh, disappears very quickly. While increased income may have a transitory effect, it quickly dissipates. I want to talk in, the, in that context about the actual effects of environmental degradation on our well-being as well. And there's now a substantial literature which shows that the social and environmental costs of rising consumption and economic growth generate health and well-being risks of their own. People exposed to persistent noise, to drought, to floods, and unusual weather are more likely to report feelings of unhappiness. 
And in the case of extreme heat in Australia, and we've had a rising um, heat uh, across a number of communities, including in West Australia this summer, where it was unbearable, that we're admitted in increased numbers to emergency psychiatric care. One study showed that while it appears to be generally assumed that humans will simply adapt to warmer climates, for instance, in reality, even modest global warming could expose large fractions of the population to unprecedented heat stress, and that with severe warming, this would become intolerable. Probably not with the people who all have air conditioners which are contributing more to the problem, but to those communities which are unable to afford it. In recent studies, the state of the environment has been shown to be an important predictor in national differences in subjective well-being. One study tracked 67 countries between 72 and 2000, and climate variables were shown to have a highly significant effect on, on well-being. Uh, and objections from those trend, projections from those trends, I'm sorry, indicated that countries with very high summer temperatures, like Australia, were the most likely to suffer reductions in well-being as a result of climate change. And I might say, thank you, Marius, I might say that the evidence suggests that Australia is one of only five countries in the world now where in the recent past subjective well-being has actually gone backwards. I want to conclude by having a look at one of the things that drives uh, some of these ills, if you like, from economic growth. One is rising inequality. We know that uh, along with economic growth and the sorts of models that are pushed to get faster economic growth, we've had rising inequality, including in countries like our own. Australia is increasingly unequal. We're now sitting toward the bottom end of the OECD countries. And rising inequality, we know, is associated with a range of social and physical ills. Over time, the more unequal a society becomes, the more the health effects will be evident. For example, if you look across the globe at the developed world, I'm not talking about the stage at which people are emerging from poverty, but the developed world, the most unequal societies have a complex array of social problems. Greater obesity, higher drug use, uh, shorter life expectancy, lack of social trust, and so on. And Australia, as I say, poor educational outcomes, which I think is one of the critical downsides of all of this. If you look at Australia, we've been heading south, so to speak, for quite some time. As inequality grows here, so do the social problems, which can't be fixed with Band-Aids. They have to do with that sense of cohesiveness that goes with being a member of an unequal society. And at the same time, of course, the marketing that we're subjected to the pressure to consider economic growth and the money that we have as the critical variables means that we have more people in our communities who are frankly materialistic. And we know that materialism produces its own set of negative outcomes. We know, as I said, that beyond a certain point, the premise that more consumption and greater wealth improve uh, well-being doesn't stand up to scrutiny. But what people perhaps don't realise is that there's a lot of evidence to show that those people who are most materialistic within a society are also the least happy. And while a lot of people would probably find that unsurprising, I think they wouldn't appreciate just how substantial an impact it can be. And popular culture, of course, presses these uh, questions of materialism on us. In popular culture, selfishness and materialism are no longer seen, as they were when I was growing up, as moral problems, but as cardinal goals in life. More for me, as one television advertisement boasts. And indeed, if you look at the way we talked about the recent budget, constantly people came back to the question of what's in it, what's in it for me? And radio announcers, I heard several of them say, and now we're going to examine the question of what the budget does for you. I didn't hear anyone ask the question, what does the budget do for people who are in need? What does the budget do for the wider community? What does the budget do for the environment? What does the budget do for uh, the next generation? The question was, what does the budget do for me? And I think that's a very significant problem in the way we think about the economy at the moment. The, ins the influence of consumerism, of course, is pervasive, and it's buttressed by that enormous industry we call marketing and advertising, and it is extremely difficult. But I think we should know that that sort of materialism comes at a price. People who are materialistic take more drugs, drink more alcohol, are more inclined to treat other people as things, care less about the environment, and are generally more miserable than those people who have other values in their lives. And while I'm not suggesting that people give up consuming, I think there's another way to do this. And there are, of course, a number of economists, 
uh, social commentators, people, thoughtful people, who are trying to press a different way of being in our community. There's accumulating evidence, as I've suggested, from a variety of disciplines and perspectives that points clearly to the conclusion that increasing material wealth doesn't necessarily improve individual or collective well-being. In fact, quite the opposite. And that we should be looking to other models of economic activity, economic growth in a, a new sense, so-called steady state or green economics, for example. And even people who've been rewarded for their work on theories of growth, like Robert Solow, uh, who won what is actually not the Nobel Prize for economics, but we'll leave that aside, for his work on growth theory, said he now regards himself as agnostic on whether growth can continue. And he said, there's no reason at all why capitalism could not survive without slow or even no growth. And I think that's the argument and discussion we have to have. There are alternatives. It is possible to do things differently, but we have to have the, the imagination and the discussion and the research work and the thought put into devising these models that take us away from the 19th century engineers who devised the one we're working with today. As I walked in here, uh, Today, I bought a book by a writer who I always commend, Andre Makin. I don't know if any of you know him. He's a Russian writer, very fine in translation. I don't know what he's like in Russian. He writes in French sometimes. But literally, the page fell open <laughs> here. I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know what it's about. But this is fabulous, this little, this little quote, talking about a couple. Um, Their joy came from the things one does not possess, from what other people had abandoned or scorned, but above all, this sunset, this scent of warm bark, these clouds above the young trees in the graveyard, these belonged to everybody. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carmen Lawrence, thank you very much. It's instructive just to realise that growth is just another idea and it can be debated rather than just assumed and we figure out how to, how to achieve it. Instructive uh, in itself. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, this is the nearest question I can see, so I'll begin with this gentleman here. Thanks, Carmen, for that. Uh, in my own small way, I'm trying to spread the message by hopefully delivering a talk at Woodford uh, titled Why commuter cycling is bad for the economy. Um, and the question actually relates to that, how do we actually embed this new story out in the mainstream or to what I call the great unwashed? Well, probably it doesn't help to think of it as an elite preoccupation. Um, I don't mean that to be a criticism of what you just said, but I think these, these are not complex ideas and people, as I say, are a bit uneasy. If you talk to people about the level of consumption, a lot of them will tell you that they feel that there's something wrong with it. But because the message that's coming from the elites on the economic side is that it's, you know, there isn't any alternative and you've got to, this is the way you've got to live, um, I guess they haven't had an opportunity to think about alternatives. So I think the only way to do it, frankly, is to talk about it. And it is interesting, and I mentioned a number of economists who are now starting to say, hmm... Maybe the original construction of capitalism is, uh, you know, at fault here. That the idea that you can just continue, or at least of the, of the economy, that you can just keep consuming indefinitely. And then when you sit beside that and say, well, maybe people aren't all that happy when they do that anyway. And I didn't talk about it today, but one of the things you pay for, um, one of the, the price you pay for all this consumption is lost time with family, too many hours at work, too much time commuting, I mean, Daniel Kahneman's done some lovely work in which he shows that the things that people most hate, that make them most unhappy, are travelling to and from work, this is in the United States, and being at work. <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit cheeky, but I think we have to, you know, people work too hard. They don't spend enough time with their families because they're, you know, collecting all this stuff. They're told that that matters. And I think we need a kind of a reversal of thinking to something a bit more like what the eight-hour day people were grappling with all those you know, decades ago, well, a century ago, really. Talk. Talk. You, you mentioned about morality and waste, um, but I'd like to know what you uh, think in terms of, um, for example, the budget of Australia, where second to perhaps Centrelink, 
that the highest item of all of cost annually is the, the defence bill under all the names of defence. What about that? Defence? You're talking yeah, about what defense? effect does that have in terms of waste and morality? Well, I think there are a whole range of arguments for reducing defence expenditure <laughs> and focusing on some of those things that make people um, happier. Uh, as we know, a lot of the uh, problems that exist in the world today uh, are the result of growing environmental consequences of human habitation, whether it's competition for water or land. Uh, serious commentators will now place uh, those environmental uh, struggles, if you like, uh, firmly um, as causes of conflict and there's a lot of evidence to that effect. So if by focusing on, if you like, the right things, peace, peaceable coexistence and the well-being of citizens rather than growth in the economy, uh, we would, I think, have a different view about defence. So it is interesting. I mentioned Costa Rica being on the top of the nations uh, in terms of measures of happiness. <coughs> they don't have a defence force at all. They don't have a defence force. Now, I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> um, that would really discredit me in the eyes of the people who already think I'm a bit weird. <laughs> but, but I do think it's, a, again, another question. Why do we need? Why do we need the level of defence preparedness that we have in Australia? Who, who is going to attack us? And if we were um, a, a peaceable um, citizen of the region, I think we have little to fear, frankly. But maybe that's naive. Uh, New Zealand seems to think that. Yeah, they have, think. yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, the lady in the back, and then there's a lady at the front here for the next question. Carmen, the question I wanted to ask you was about population. It was part of your advertised blurb that you were talking about and I was looking forward to that part because it's one of the major contributors to this fantasy of economic growth. Would you care to comment on it for us? Thank yes, you. I'm sorry. I didn't put that in my um, uh, speech because I didn't actually have it in there in the first place. I think that was a bit of creative advertising on the part of it. So I'm sorry if that misled you. Uh, population, of course, is critical. Absolutely. Um, but it's not always the population... Uh, unfortunately, the debate very quickly slips over into looking at other people's population rather than our own. It's population that consumes like we do that's the principal problem, number one. It's population altogether that's a problem as well. I mean, some people say we'll hit nine and a half, even I've seen recently 10 billion, and then the population will stabilise, maybe even start to tip down again. But I don't think the planet can afford the, the seven billion we've got right now. I think we are too many and we're too many people consuming at the rate that we do. I mean, the, the addition of an, an, another Australian is more of a problem, frankly, than the addition of another Bangladeshi, and we have to keep that in our minds as well, because otherwise, when you're talking to people in the developing world, you know, it sounds pretty hideous uh, to talk about population control when you're the one who's really the source, major source of the problem. So it is a big issue, and I know it's... Uh, there's a whole set of questions too. I don't want to live in a country, Australia, where the cities are too big, the, the, the rivers are polluted, uh, that arable land is being taken over by uh, coal mining, as happened in um, the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. Uh, I think we're, I reckon that Australia is probably about at the maximum now, but that's not a view that's shared by everybody because people believe that you can squash us in and that sitting 45 minutes, an hour and a half, two in traffic to get to work is a price you pay. I, I think we're sacrificing quality of life for, again, this is an economic growth thing. Why do you need all these extra people? Because it's what gr makes the economy grow, because people are building more houses, more white goods, and blah, 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 so it goes on. So they, they are all related, absolutely. Lady here. And um, just go up to the back there, the gentleman there with his hand raised afterwards. Building on the, uh, the question that was just asked, um, a lot of the conversation around low growth economics has been around, uh, you know, as humans we innovate and we get better at doing things. And as we innovate we, we end up having uh, less need for people to do things and so we have this declining rate of employment if the economy stays at the same size. And so there's a lot of conversation around the economy being a machine that either grows or collapses. It, it goes up or it goes down by, by virtue of its sort of very structure. Um, what ways do you see out of that? I mean, I don't say that as a challenge because I, I want to know, you know. Well, I, I don't think there is a simple answer to that. That's why I say that the discussion has to go on. There are people who work in the field of steady-state economics, for instance, who argue that 
if you place more emphasis on the initial quality of what is manufactured, the stuff, and more emphasis on, on uh, refurbishing and recycling and you know, managing what you have. I was shocked recently, for example, to discover that tradesmen now, um, th this guy was a, a, a carpenter, rather than having a, a very expensive fine tool, saw in this case, which uh, you know, he looked after and, and protected and you know, probably got sharpened regularly, he had throwaway saws. You, people here probably know this. I didn't. I was just it shocked me. Worth about twenty dollars, and he went down to the local hardware, big hardware chain, and got another one every whatever it was that he needed it. Chucked it away. Now this stuff had, uh, you know, it had a lot of material in it, and some of it probably will be recycled, but not much. We're dissipating this stuff all over the world. So I think if you if you refocus the the nature of economic activity. And as I say, if Ruben's right, we're going to have to pull back because of the oil question and do a lot more stuff locally. And I suspect then people will see the consequences more fully of what the, their consumption is doing. Is that in a sense, we export the environmental problems too to other parts of the world. So, you know, thinking green, thinking steady state, thinking quality. I mean, so much of what you buy actually is rubbish. You know, it is disposable. And instead of demanding a high quality, people pay actually quite a lot. It's cheaper, I know, than it perhaps used to be, but still pay quite a lot for something that doesn't function very well for very long. It lasts just long enough, you know. <laughs> so it, I just think all of those questions about quality are important to revisit and, and to, you know, be more like our grandparents' generation, that things could be reused. You didn't have to get a new one every time. And if you do those, those roadside tours, you know, again, it's sometimes shocking to see what people just throw out. They don't even bother to find a, a nice new home for it, you know, just how it goes. I think there's a chap up, midway up. Dematerialisation not happening immediately. No, <laughs> no, no, we're using more stuff. Don't let anyone tell you we're using less. It's, uh... um, you spoke really compellingly about the severe shortcomings of GDP as a one-shot driver of public policy. But so would you care to advocate what some good candidates are for quantitative analysis for making good decisions to deal with all the problems you outlined? Well, as you know, um, well, from the sound of your question, you're probably better informed on this than I am, but the OECD uh, have done quite a lot of work on alternative and more complex indicators, which put the, the various, uh, if you like, charges on the economy on the right side of the ledger. So they do take account of the depletion of natural resources. They do take account of the deterioration in built capital, which we tend not to do. Um, uh, they do look at the consequences of, say, road trauma. Uh, because at the moment, if you're, if you're injured, the quality of your life, the quality of life years you lead, is, is severely diminished. That doesn't appear in the GDP. The, the fellow who fix up, fixes up your car, if you're lucky enough, uh, there probably is a fellow in Australia still, and the, the people who provide the, the health services, that will appear in the GDP as a plus. Uh, really putting it all on the right side of the ledger. So all of those things, and, and including voluntary labour. Because if we don't, I mean, unfortunately, if we don't put a number on some of these things, although I worry about doing that too, uh, they tend to disappear. But voluntary labour, child rearing, those sorts of things, care of the elderly, when you pay for them, they appear in the GDP. When you do them yourself or your community does it, they don't. So the best measures that I've seen are basically squaring the, you know, the ledger, if you like, and looking at the quality of life, and they're sometimes called genuine progress indicators and so on. So that when our, and Treasury flirted a while under Ken Henry with producing such a measure, and I think the ABS even started to collect some of the data. Now, I don't know how far that's gone. I haven't heard anything about it for a while. Um, and uh, um, Clive Hamilton and Richard Dennis also did some work with the Australia Institute nearly a decade ago, and they devised one for Australia, which showed that Australia if you look at genuine progress as opposed to GDP, has been flatlining since about 1970. You mentioned something else from the OECD in your, your speech too, which surprises me, it's not part of the political debate, which is we are one of the most unequal in mm. terms of income distribution of all developed countries, mm. and we're becoming more unequal under both Labor and the Coalition. That's right. It's a trend that's been going on now since the mid-80s uh, mid probably, and it should be part of the discussion. And the thing that worries me, I'm doing some work at the moment on, uh, on school funding for, for the government is the gap that's opening up between top and bottom performers. And it's starting now, interesting, to drag down the top performers, which is one of the effects of inequality. 
everybody is worse off in an unequal society, not just the people at the bottom. Yeah, there was a specific OECD finding about uh, our schools that parental income is a bigger determinant in Australian education than other comparable countries. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it's getting worse. Yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um. Carmen, thank you very much. It's a um, terrific discussion that you've opened up. And I wanted to come in on the um, increasing inequality that has been a feature of Australia, particularly over the last decade, and point out that population growth is a primary driver of income inequality, and it's not well recognised, but in Australia and internationally, um, the, the countries that are growing fastest are the most unequal, and it's because of the population growth um, and the oversupply of labour. Australia doesn't have a labour shortage at all. It's, <laughs> um, it's got some greedy people who want to push down the cost of labour. They want more people applying for each job, not more people to fill jobs. So. I, I want to challenge you on the idea that it's um, impertinent for us to talk about population growth in developing countries because they want to be able to control <laughs> their fertility and it's us and the USA that are preventing them from getting the resources. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'd like you to perhaps comment on the relationship between inequality between countries and within countries in terms of population Look, I'd, be the, I'd be the last to argue that uh, population is not a problem in the developing world too. I just think that the stance that a lot of people in the West develop sounds pretty uh, patronising often, uh, you know, when they're, when, they're making, when they're having these discussions. And if you read the literature, as you clearly do, that emerges from places like India and China, they are very well aware of the fact China has a one-child policy after all, that that you know, the, the, the increase in population that they've seen can't be sustained. Um, and in many parts of the world, that remains a problem that's not being addressed by their communities. And the distribution of resources and the access to resources clearly is a problem when you have burgeoning populations and young people who don't live, you know, don't live a full life, their life expectancy in some of those communities is appalling. So I'm not saying it's not a problem. I just sometimes find the stance that people adopt a bit, you know, a bit patronising. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that you mentioned about the population driving inequality, um, it is a bit of a chicken and egg question. Uh, you look at some countries that, like the United Kingdom, who haven't had huge increases in population compared with, say, um, well, well, look at look at look at UK and Japan. Interesting case in point in the developed world. The UK has become much much more unequal. Japan has. Uh, remained equal, um, in fact, become more equal over time. Japan has a list of some social ills, but that's tiny in comparison to the UK. Now, OK, Japan's population is ageing um, and the UK's is younger because of some migration, but over the time period that's relevant, I don't think there was much difference in their po rate of population growth. It was active economic... Some, some. Active economic policy. The Japanese have a very narrow distribution of income in the UK, it's huge. Now, it could be driven by population. I haven't seen that argued fully. I know that some people have said so. It's certainly true in the developing world. I don't know if it's true in the developed world. Um, interesting question, though. Thank you for that. There was an arm... Um, about two th the, the... Um, as an academic, I'm just wondering, do you see any hope for a positive change in the university culture? Because from what you're saying, it sounds like the departments of psychology and sociology are quite progressive. But as you probably know, uh, most economic departments, or the ones I've seen anyway, are, are very way behind. You know, and, and what I've seen is like, I mean, as you know, ecological economics, which you know, fundamentally says that a socioeconomic system is a subsystem of the greater environment and the biosphere. Now, that's based on hard empirical science and how come our universities are uh, lagging so behind such that if you go to a, a lecture on ecological economics, it's not even compulsory for economic majors. It's just an elective. And who goes to that course? Just a f handful of um, uh, international students, about 15 at the most. So do you see any hope for a change in academic culture and what's being taught? <laughs> um. <laughs> As an academic? <laughs> It, it, it's, it's nice of you to call me an academic too. I, I feel as if I'm pretending, really. Um, but it's been a great pleasure to be back in the university environment. I've actually been encouraged by the fact uh, that, that within the universities that I have most to do with in Western Australia principally at the moment, 
there's actually a real appetite for rethinking these things. And I don't know if you've noticed a couple of new websites that are out there now trying to create these conversations. One is actually called The Conversation, um, which is the group of eight universities. I wish they wouldn't be so exclusive, but quite apart from that, it does give um, academics an opportunity, and several of them have addressed this question. The series of posts, I don't know if you've come across it, Marius, but mm. just called The Conversation. It's been up for, I guess, about a month or so now. It's very professionally done, um, and uh, I think will be an interesting contribution to Australian political debate. And it's, it's all the contrib contributions come from uh, academics and uh, CSIRO scientists. I'm also part of another group, I'm going to give a little plug here, called um, Shaping Tomorrow's World. So it's www.shapingtomorrowsworld, no apostrophe, I'm sorry, because that won't let you do that, .org. And that's a bunch of us at UWA and Murdoch and Curtin who are trying to say, well, is there another way to think about economics? Is there another way to think about uh, the way we um, conduct our agriculture? Uh, what about renewable energy? Is there any such thing, really? Um, what are the consequences of continuing to think of technological solutions as the only things that need to be addressed? So it's an attempt. It's very early. It's only been up for about a week. So I think there are some interesting waves. I'm not saying that it's... Uh, permeated uh, conventional and orthodox economics, which does seem still to have a stranglehold. But by the time you look at um, uh, ecological economics, behavioural economics, there are a whole lot of people kind of clawing away at the edges of this model. And eventually, I think it will collapse under the weight of its own uh, assumptions. And on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to end. My apologies to people who had questions here and uh, elsewhere in the uh, auditorium, but we are out of time, so it's just time to say... Carmen Lawrence, that, that it's great to present um, growth as just another idea in the marketplace of ideas and uh, one deserving of scrutiny. Thanks very much for your contribution. Thanks, Maurice.